This gadget here was supposedly the answer to all my houseplant pest troubles, guaranteed to eradicate spider mites, thrips, scale, mealybugs and any other sap sucking or leaf munching pest that's infested my plant collection this year. It's nearly a month later, has it worked? Let's find out. And we are in. So as well as the sulfur hot box, we'll take a look at what else has been happening in here throughout November after the recent temperature changes I implemented. And if you stick around till the end, I'll update you on a couple of bad purchases I made and of course some other news too. So let's start with the hot box. So far, it's only been a month, but it's proved to be really easy to use, apart from a minor disaster when I tripped over the cable, pulling all the wires out, bending the hot plate out of shape. Oops. Fortunately, it's all fitted nicely back together with no apparent damage. So let's take a look at some of the plants that were the most obvious harbingers of spider mites and thrips, beginning over here with the plumeria. Now, bearing in mind it's currently towards the end of November now, and even if totally clean of pests, these plants will naturally drop all their leaves and go dormant through winter. Well, we can see nice new clean leaves, totally free from mite, and there's even some flower buds forming. Compare these to this older damaged leaf. The rest of the damaged leaves have already fallen off. So far, so good. Now, I don't expect this plumeria will keep all its leaves, nor will these buds have time to bloom as the days get increasingly shorter and darker. But so far, the sulfur has worked pretty well on these plants. There's no visible sulfur dust on anything, only a faint smell of sulfur in the air. And actually, it's not unpleasant to my nose. It quickly dissipates over time as well. Another main culprit was the philodendron verrucosum that had thrips nonchalantly ambling across the surface of its leaves, even when I sprayed insecticide directly onto them. The result so far is that no thrips are visible and you can see now how much it's grown just in the last few weeks. It's still early days for the sulfur hot box but both in here and in the greenhouse there have been some noticeable changes for the better in the plants that I knew had spider mites and even in some that I only suspected had mites of some description. You can see it in the renewed growth, something that shouldn't really be happening at any real pace at this time of year. There are of course other mites that attack plants that can't actually be seen even with a hand lens. Tarsonamin mites for one, sometimes called broad mites, which I strongly suspect I've had too, especially in the greenhouse. I know I have had them for sure on cyclamen in the past. So this hot box solution really does appear to be the answer to my prayers and only time will tell if that remains to be the case. So the other big change I made in early autumn over here in the hothouse was to lower the nighttime temperature to 10 degrees Celsius from 18 degrees Celsius during the day, purely as a money saving tactic using my Inkbird controller which allows two different day and night temperature settings. I mentioned in the video that this would be a process and that I expected to have to tweak things depending on how my plants responded. Well, in the main, the vast majority of my plants didn't flinch. The orchids coped, the aroids coped, the Tradescantia and all the other genera coped. However, begonias didn't. Again though, not unexpected. Begonia griffon, begonia luxurians, begonia silver lace and a few others, they all drop the leaves at anything below 15 degrees celsius, something that I've experienced before. It doesn't mean it kills them, but you know, I like things to be in leaf. The question I needed answering was whether they would be okay at the lower temperature for only a fraction of the day. In the past I've only tried it like a lower temperature 24 hours a day. Begonia luxuriance was already a shadow of its former self if you recall due to being drowned while I was away on holiday. So initially hardly any of my begonias coped with 10 degrees celsius even for only 12 hours out of a 24 hour period but that was the starting point for my tweaking the settings. So after several adjustments in both temperature and in duration I settled on this. Currently I've got 14 and a half hours per day at 18 degrees celsius and then overnight for nine and a half hours at 15 degrees celsius and that seems to be the best i can get away with and still have the begonias in growth as you can see from the new leaves starting to grow i realize this is quite different to what i started with but consider i was previously paying for 18 degrees celsius 24 hours per day so you can see i'll still be making quite a substantial saving over the winter months a few of my begonias didn't actually bat an eyelid at the lower temperatures and continued to grow strongly which might be useful to know for some people wanting to grow them in cooler rooms. Firstly there's begonia black fang looking absolutely wonderful here with its exploding star in the center of each leaf and then there's begonia mazai a species over here which is looking wonderful and getting huge probably ready for a cutback 
very soon actually before it falls over. Then there's Begonia Bowerai, brought over from the greenhouse even though it's pretty good at lower temperatures. It's looking gorgeous as usual with its intricate patterns and multitude of colours and shades. You might also have noticed that Begonia longiciliata is no longer over here. I've moved it into the greenhouse as it was so large and it doesn't actually mind the cooler temperatures over there. As ever, it's all about close observation and then action depending on how the plants react. So in other hothouse news, I've spent perhaps naively too much cash on my two wishlist begonias. That was begonia zumba, begonia chlorosticta, if that's how you pronounce it. And you can see them in all their glory down here in the heated propagator. I say in all their glory with a little tongue in cheek. Begonia Zumba, a cultivar from Bowerai, had one single leaf left after shipping. The rest completely snapped off. So I've popped them all in the pot, uh, just in the hopes that some of them might root, which is a distinct possibility, knowing how easily begonias root. And so far it's looking promising, providing I continue to protect them. Begonia Chlorosticta, however, I'm afraid is looking somewhat near to death if it isn't already dead. And to be fair, it was only a seedling. I guess I was hoping it would be somewhat larger than it turned out to be. So that'll have to be put down to experience and hopefully one day I'll get a better specimen of this unique begonia. And it really is a gorgeous one, can't wait to get one that's decent. Another new species begonia I bought was begonia raja, which looks like it too isn't a huge fan of 15 degrees celsius, as you can see from the leaf damage already. My first line of attack was to move it more in line with the heater and into more light. I'll keep a close eye on it and if it doesn't perk up over the next couple of days, I'll put it in the heated propagator with the others and cover it with a transparent lid. So let's take a look at some other things that's going on in here. So this Philodendrum Campos Bortianum, it's in quite a small pot, about 12 centimetre pot, and as you can see, it's really, really going for it. Now you can imagine if I did actually have that on a fully mossed pole, not just one of these coyo ones, and if it was rooting into that, it would just go huge. So for me, even though I like the ones that are in moss poles and they have all the leaves, great big huge things, I've just not got the space for it. So for me, it's easier of course, just to buy one of the cheap coyo ones and it won't go as big and I can just keep trimming it back. Philodendron melanocrysum, you can see here, is doing really well. This was another one with thrips and mites and it's beginning to head for the roof. And what I'm going to have to do now with that is get another pole for that and see if I can somehow find a space for it in this rapidly shrinking space that I call the hothouse. My Hoya Carnosa Crimson Queen, which I also suspected had some kind of mites on it. I couldn't see any, but as I mentioned earlier, not all mites are visible. Some mites are actually invisible to the naked eye, like for example, Tarsonomid mites, and I know I've had those in the past. And this has done much, much better since I had the sulfur hot box. And you can see it's actually going for it up there on the roof. It's got loads of loads of beautiful colours. It did actually bloom for the first time this year. So I'm really impressed with that. I'm talking about Hoyas. This one is Hoya Wilbur Graves. Absolutely beautiful leaves. And this one was sent to me as a cutting from SMA. And it's done really well. And again, it's going to be something that is going to have to go into a pot or a hanging basket of some sort as it begins to twine and send off a vining shoot. My begonia Connie Boswell over here, you might have noticed that that is a shadow of its former self. What happens with these plants is they get more and more leggy and eventually you've got to do something with them. You can't just let them just get longer and longer and longer because they just look ridiculous. They end up with burst stems at the bottom. So what I do with this one or what I've started to do with this one is cut it back to the lowest leaf and I may cut it back even lower. If I can get some more breaks down here, some more budding shoots down here with new leaves, then I will cut back even right down to there if I can. But that is half of what it was before, and we do have some leaves on that. Of course, at the moment, I'm still in the middle of tweaking the temperatures. So once it's settled down and began to grow again, no doubt we'll get some new young shoots down there, and then I'll cut it back down to there to kind of restart it off. This is Piper sylvatica. I believe it's a vine. Again, it was a cutting. It's taken a while to take off but it's beginning to come for me now. I don't know if you noticed, there's these like little white globules. I've looked at them through the hand lens and they are completely spherical. So I'm guessing they are being given off by the plant, given off by the back of the plant, but there are some on the front as well. I don't know if anybody knows what they are and if this particular plant is well known for them. You can just about see them actually. It feels like a dust on your fingers. 
but they are they're definitely not a pest they are kind of uniformly distributed along the underside of the leaf so interesting to know what that was if anybody can shed some light on that please tell me in the comments and of course you've seen all my Tradescantia surintoides nanook which are going to be getting the grow bag treatment so give us a thumbs up for that because that's going to be a long-term project it's going to take several months if not 12 months before you see the outcome of that so i better get on with filming that soon haven't i and begonia melanobulata here this very hurry very spiky one didn't mind the lower temperatures one little bit i believe it does grow on exposed cliff faces maybe that's something to do with it really nice thing very happy with that and it's growing bigger and bigger which is what we want so other plants to look at the caloria unsurprisingly some of the other caloria have gone into dormancy now seeing as it's so cool at this time of year probably partly to do with the light as well but this one has decided it's going to come into its absolute best at this time of year so that I expect I mean, there's tons of buds on it that's going to look really really good it's never come this good at this time of year before the drowning it got through August was obviously something to do with that so it's making up for lost time so I'm not really disappointed I'm quite looking forward to that coming into bloom this lovely solid mutata another begonia solid mutata has lost a lot of its leaves this is a rhizomatous variety lost a lot generally because of the cold and you can see what's going on there but i expect it will begin to come into growth again now that i've raised the temperatures up to around 15. this one is begonia sea urchin again it needs the temperatures to be warm to really come into its own which it is beginning to do now that the temperatures have gone up i'm not really a fan of african violets i thought i would be because it was one of the first plants i grew as a young child but i've just found that for whatever reason i'm not that drawn to them although that is quite pretty and down here we have a really really nice variegated one i don't know if you've ever seen a variegated african violet i've never seen this in bloom yet but that one is really quite something. I quite like the leaves on that, very, very attractive. My Escananthus is still hanging on in bloom though. That's done really well. I may well get some more Escananthus because there are quite a number of varieties. And this one seems to do really well in here despite being drowned through summer. I have a number of Tradescantias in here doing particularly well at the moment. Again, these are other plants that the mites love, not necessarily the mites that you see they do tend to really come back strongly when sprayed and of course in this case i'm not spraying them anymore i am actually just using the hot box here we've got zebrina triscanti a zebrina variety discolor multicolor and it really is giving me plenty of multicolors there i've cut it off i don't know how many times and it's still doing really well so far it hasn't succumbed to the burst stem syndrome that we usually get at some point but no doubt that will happen as these stems get longer and longer and this one at the side here is purple joy and i can't actually remember whether that is a genuine cultivar or one of those invalid names calicia golden doing really well i give that a massive cut back at the end of the summer but it's beginning to grow really well again and its sister plant over here this one had an even bigger cut back just based on the fact that it kept falling over and this one i can't remember what it's called this one is uh, calicia repens rosato rosato or pink panther that one's doing particularly well as well that is just absolutely bulletproof and loves this kind of environment so today it appears to be about trial and error but i'm not a huge fan of that phrase as it sounds like you're making random changes in the hope that something works which isn't the case i prefer to think of them as educated adjustments based on previous experience and observed evidence but that isn't quite as catchy so tell me in the comments if any of you have had any instances this year where you've made some educated adjustments to your plant care i'd love to hear about these learning moments because they can help us all improve our own care so go on rack your brains for me and if you've been inspired by the begonias you've seen today well maybe not the chlorosticta i want to see them when they were actually at their best through summer here's a tour i did of all the varieties i had at the time 21 i think in all of course i have plenty more now but that's plant collecting for you i'm sure you get it i'll see you on the next one Bye.